Praise the Lord. If you'll turn to Jeremiah 5, we're going to have another enlightening study, helpful study in the principles of the Old Testament prophets as they apply to the church. And I trust that you're doing more with the teachings that we've given thus far than just listening to them because we've set forth any number of principles that would apply to our life and the admonition we need today. Chapter 5 is entitled, The Search for a Righteous Man. The Search for a Righteous Man. Now that's not as easy to find one as you may think, or as we'll see as we get into the chapter. Now Jerusalem, just like the world, was so totally corrupt and spiritually degenerate, so unheeding of God's call to repent, that judgment was really the only course left open to God. But because of his great mercy, he promises that he will postpone judgment on one condition, as we see in this chapter, and that one condition is that if Jeremiah can find one, that's one, Righteous man in the city. Now you should think that that wouldn't be too hard a task. But as we'll find, that was a big order. God said in verse 1, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man. That's all he's asking for, a man. If there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. If he can find one man. We're going to be dealing with this under several headings tonight, the search for a righteous man. And first of all, is the need for a righteous man. The need for a righteous man. And we'll see there is a need because Jerusalem is so corrupt. The entire chapter deals with that fact, and of course much of the book, that the nation's total degeneration was so great that God over in verses 20 to 23 and verse 28 says she's gone beyond anything imaginable. Like verse 28, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They overpass, that is, exceed the deeds of the wicked. And she has refused correction, verse 3, where they have been stricken and they have not been grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they refuse to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. So as we see again, just as we've seen in the previous four chapters, sin so blinds the eyes that you cannot see. The hand of God in his chastisement, punishment, or judgment. And you will do, as they do, begin to attribute what is actually chastisement to something else, to circumstances, to fate, to bad breaks, or to coincidence, or a trial. You may call it a trial. Look at verse 12, where though he has tried to correct them, they refuse to be corrected. And they have belied, literally denied the Lord, that is, they're denying the Lord is correcting them. They're charging that to something else, their problems. They deny the Lord and said, it is not he, that is, he's not the one, verse 3, that's correcting and punishing them. Neither shall evil come upon us, that is, from the Lord, neither shall we see the sword nor famine. And so we see here, as we've seen in the previous chapters, when you ignore your conscience too often, it becomes insensitive, seared, defiled. When you ignore the correction of God long enough, then your heart becomes hardened like a rock, verse 3. And you begin to explain away correction, as I say, as other things, coincidence, bad circumstances, the hand of fate, or it's just a trial of faith or whatever. Oh yes, I criticized again this or that, but after all, no one is perfect. 
rather than seeing that the trial or the problem that you're going through is a result of that criticism, you just attribute it to, well, a weakness, like a weakness of the flesh or whatever, or yes, I'm probably a little lukewarm here lately. I haven't been in the Word in prayer as I should. But you don't attribute the trials and the problems domestically or whatever, physically, to God's chastening hand. You just keep ignoring the divine chastisement. As we see in verse 12, you say, Oh, it's not the Lord, and neither shall evil come upon me, and neither will I see the sword, nor the famine. Now, when you get to that place, you see the only thing left open, like with Judah, Israel, was judgment, or would be judgment. And this is the condition that we find so many churches, or people in the churches today. Like the world, they've lost their spiritual discernment of right and wrong. And you see so much in the church that reveals they have no discernment. We live in an age when professing Christians have lost their ability even to be shocked or to be shamed. Turn over to chapter 6 and verse 15. He said, Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. In other words, they had gotten to the place because of their great sinfulness. They didn't know how to blush. They didn't know how to be ashamed. And so we're living in that kind of a time today, friends. I've said it many times that this generation in which we live, the last one, has lost its capacity to blush or to be ashamed that its sins are the sins of others. And I'm talking about people in the church that have grown up in a generation where there's very little moral awareness. And we've even heard people say in this church things that, well, it causes me to blush, and they call it a testimony. And I think we should be careful even how we express ourselves in testimonies. You shouldn't make references to the bedroom or trying to get pregnant. I mean, if you've been blessed with a child, then just say that the Lord has blessed us and we're expecting a child. Hello. That's right. I hear things that cause me to blush, and I won't mention some of them because they're in bad taste. So we find ourselves living in a time saturated with sex and violence and trashy vision and immorality and lying and cheating until the churches are filled with people like in 6 and verse 15 who've lost their ability to blush. And that's why the call to be separate and come out from among them, to be crucified with Christ, to be holy as God is holy, just falls on deaf ears. That's why it took so long even in this church. People who said they wanted to go deeper with God and so forth. It's why it's taking so long to get us to the place where we're really taking seriously what the Spirit is saying to the church about separating the world in its ways. All of its ways. And you can name them for yourself. And people suffer chastisement, but they say, like Israel, well, it's not God, it's a trial, or this or that and the other. And so the need for such a man is because there are so few people who know how to blush or be ashamed of sin, whether in their lives, their homes, their church, somebody's testimony, or the world in general. Learn how to blush again. You hear people say things today that 25 years ago, the same people, if they'd lived in that culture would have blushed and wouldn't have said them. Secondly, the value of such a man, also in verse 1. We see the need for one because of the low spiritual condition of the church today, just like in Jeremiah's day. The value of such a man, we see here, we've already read it, so no point in repeating it, that God says he will withhold judgment for the present if he can find one righteous man in the city. Now, this reminded me, and I suppose maybe some of you, of the promise that God made to Abraham concerning Sodom, that he would spare that wicked city if he could find ten righteous men. Genesis 18. But I want you to notice something here. Jerusalem is so corrupt that while God makes Jeremiah the same promise that he made Abraham about Sodom, he reduces the requirement to one. Which means, and he said it before, he says it in his word, that Jerusalem was more corrupt than Sodom. Now, if you wonder how that be, well, that's the way it is. And so it is today. America, they call it a Christian nation. Let's get it back to God like it used to be. It never was. 
And we won't go through that again. It's on too many tapes. It shows the condition of the city and, of course, this nation that God was willing to pardon it if he could find one. Now, of course, we realize here he's speaking, I don't know a better word, it just comes to me, with hyperbole. If you study Greek, you know that's an intentional exaggeration to try to make a point. Because, of course, there were other righteous men besides Jeremiah in the city. But what God is doing here, showing us the great sinfulness of the city. If you read the accounts, like in Ezekiel 21, 1 to 4, you'll see there were righteous people carried off to Babylon. Ezekiel himself being one of them. Daniel was another righteous man and his three friends. And so there were more than one righteous one, but by comparison, the godly in the city would just be a small company. That's in the time of Elijah. He thought he was the only righteous man left. But you remember God said, I have 7,000 I've reserved that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. But by contrast, he's saying that if you can just find one, I'll spare the city. Now, what is the value? We're asking the question, what is the value of such a man? What is the value of a righteous man or woman in the sight of God? You see, so many of us underestimate the value of our presence as a true, faithful Christian, say, in an unsaved family, in that sort of environment, our, our presence in this corrupt city and area, county and nation for that matter. So many underestimate their value as an employee among unregenerate employees where they work, their value in a worldly church sometimes. What's your value? Well, Matthew 5, Philippians 2. We are the light of this world. The salt of the earth. And salt is preserving. The value of a righteous man, it gets the sick in the church healed. The prayer of a righteous man will heal the sick. James chapter 5. The presence of a righteous man can save a city from judgment. One righteous man... Because we see this in the case of Lot. The presence of Lot spared the city of Zoar, not Sodom, Zoar, Z-O-A-R, in Genesis 19.21. God was going to destroy it, and Lot interceded for it and said he'd like to live over there, and so God spared Zoar. He was going to destroy it too. In fact, the angel said to Lot, we can't destroy even Sodom till you get out. He's called a righteous man in Scripture. So your presence in a city can spare that city. He says he'll spare Jerusalem for one. And it only takes one. You see, one righteous man is the cause for God sparing the lives of countless wicked, unregenerate men and women like you and me. You can read that in Romans 5, verses 18 and 19, how one man, Jesus, spared us. So never underestimate your presence as a righteous man or woman in this corrupt world where ye shine, Paul says, as lights in the world, where you act as a preserving influence, salt, salt preserves. And that shows, too, the importance of living that holy separated life or you're not going to preserve anything. If you're like it, if you're identified with it, as most churchgoers are, let's face it, and some right in this church, we constantly over the weeks and months have to deal with people who are living like the world, have their life in the world. And so the importance of living the holy separated life, the importance of not hiding your light under a bushel, As I've said before, and I'll keep saying it, and maybe we'll get through to some, some never give any sort of a witness or testimony, and I'm not talking about, quote, words of a testimony, unquote, but they do not testify in their life to others in the world, where they work or whatever, that they are a Christian. The only way you'd know it, you'd have to ask them. If you are real observant, you might notice they don't use profanity or drink or gamble, but who's going to notice that, you know? But there's nothing positive. In fact, they don't even give a testimony in this church. Now, who am I talking to? I'm talking to a number of you that we've never heard from you. And probably never will. Because we've said this so many times, we haven't gotten through to you yet. 
Now, don't try to dream up a testimony, but it ought to be just flowing out of you, at least occasionally. Praise the Lord. If you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it'll just happen. You might even say amen sometimes and shock us. Well, it's as right for you to say amen or hallelujah or praise the Lord as it is for us, the rest of us. I won't look too closely at anyone because I know some that never get into that area of being a real light. Maybe you're not. You can't shine if you're not a light. But at least you're hiding it under a bushel. So the importance of not hiding your light, the importance of living a separated life, is because your presence can do a lot of sparing. Just think, a city spared from things like tornadoes and earthquakes and floods and even war, a nation even, through the presence of one person, one saint, who was an intercessor. Now, that's not something far-fetched. That's actually happened. Where tornadoes have been headed toward an area and someone with faith, someone with faith in that particular area, just rebukes that thing and it goes off at a right angle and goes over there. And, well, they didn't send it against those sinners, but it went in another direction. The presence of a person with faith. How many families have been spared death from accident or serious illness because someone who got the faith message has claimed their salvation that they'll get saved before they die? And they don't know how they come out of these plane crashes and automobile wrecks and heart attacks and all. Until, of course, they're told. But it's impossible in the natural. Or take a geographical area that's spared economic problems or a company that is saved from bankruptcy because of the presence of one or two saints that has claimed they're going to have a job in that area or in that company. And the person, well, in all natural evidence seemed to say it was going to go bankrupt. And it didn't because of the presence of somebody there believing. Now, this area, it's a fact that this area is one that is noted for having the lowest percentage of unemployment than any other area in the nation. Now, if some of you say, well, I've been out of work and half a dozen could say that, that's all right. If you'd live somewhere else, it'd be ten times, hundred times worse. Now, this area, these are facts, has one of the lowest percentages of unemployment in the nation. Now, we like to think, and I'm sure it is true, that the presence of faith assembly, at least that's one of the reasons, and maybe the only reason, people with strong prayers of faith going up continually, people walking by faith, people claiming by faith their finances and whatever, has preserved this area, I believe, from all sorts of well, economic chaos and maybe as well as catastrophes and forms of judgment that would have come just by the presence of these people. I mean, after all, God's got about 2,000 here to preserve. And we're scattered about, and so the whole area benefits. Now, if there are any skeptics or visitors here, you shouldn't be here as a skeptic, but if you are, we can't help how that sounds. That's just the way it is. And that's the principle. You heard us read it. Jeremiah 5.1, that if God can find a righteous person, he'll spare that area or that city and so on. He's looking for one. And so in view of the fact that the church is so spiritually shallow and carnal in the world today, God's still looking for that kind of a man or a woman who will be faithful and stand, as it were, in the gap so that he can spare judgment for a while until he can raise up a people, prepare a people who in the end time will do his bidding. Now, the question is, are you one of those men or women acting as a preserving influence in this area, this nation, the church? Well, I'm giving you time to think. Thirdly, the character of such a man, also described in verse 1, the need, the value, and now the character. He seemed to be one who acts justly, does justice, that is, he acts justly and righteously, and he seeks the truth. Verse 1. Now, at first glance, you might wonder why that God would list only two requirements for such a man, but as you think about these, they're pretty much all-inclusive, these two. 
He's looking for a man who does righteousness and seeks out the truth. Of course, if he is doing righteousness, he's going to be a person that God is using. If he's seeking out the truth, he'll be one who speaks the truth. Well, you know the history and the result, though. He didn't find him, did he? Because God destroyed Jerusalem. A short time after he prophesied this, he destroyed it. And so the question is, the question that God is asking you tonight is this. If you had been living in Jerusalem when Jeremiah was rushing about, he said to run and seek such a man because judgment is imminent. If you had been living in Jerusalem while he was making his search, would God have spared the city because you were there? He only needed one. Or would he have destroyed it? That's a pretty sobering question. Now you might note these two qualifications that God looked for in a man so he could spare the city for a while is the opposite to what both secular and religious man would look for. God's looking for a man who does righteousness, who seeks only the truth. Not interested in what man has to say. His creeds are the philosophers, are the intellectuals, are secular educators. He's seeking the truth, and he wouldn't find truth in any of those systems. Well, let's look at this idea. Notice what he looked for would be the opposite to what, first of all, the secular world would look for. Now, if God told the world to rush out and find a man so he could spare the city, or let's say the nation of America, they would rush out looking for some, well, athletic star, sports star, or some movie idol, and just keep on the list of what man would look for. You know, his stature, his or her beauty. And then when they found such a one, they would say, here God is our choice, ignorant of the fact that would be God's last choice. In fact, he wouldn't even take it. Or they would rush out to the universities and the scientific and intellectual communities and select some intellectual genius saying, surely God would spare this nation on his behalf because without his presence, why the nation would be set back 50, 100 years Think of all the contributions he's made to science, the inventions. Or they would search out some philosopher or humanitarian who does good, and so on. And then the religious world, what would they look for? You might want to turn over to 1 Samuel 16, because I want to refer to it in a moment. The religious world. And you'll see that God, in 1 Samuel 16, has some... Qualifications even for a religious person. Now we'll read 1 Samuel 16 in just a moment. I won't give you the verse so you don't get ahead of me. The religious world, what would they do? Well, they'd rush out and find some noted theologian, wouldn't they? That has written a book or two on why we shouldn't believe the Bible. Or they would look for the pastor of the largest church. Some of them they claim to have ten and 20,000 members. They wouldn't seat any more than this building. So it's just an ego trip to talk about having that many members if they couldn't get in the building. The Roman Catholics would put in a quick call to the Vatican and have the Holy Father come over because his presence would certainly spare judgment upon America. Or the cults would present God with one of their gurus. Or the charismatic with one of their self-appointed prophets or miracle workers or the non-charismatic surely would present God with the leading evangelists that all the denominations support and have citywide crusades together about. But here in verse 7, 1 Samuel 16, as God told Samuel when he sent him to anoint David in the place of Saul, notice he says, man looks upon the outward appearance but God looks at the heart. So religious people, that's the way it is. He's still looking for a man who will do righteously and seek the truth. And that isn't an easy task to find such a man. It is not easy at all. It isn't easy in this church to find a man or a woman who will do righteously without any hesitation or question or having to lay this or that on the shelf when they hear it. 
or say, well, I give him the benefit of the doubt, but I don't know how to answer people. They ask me about something he said or taught, and I don't know the answer. He's looking for a person who seeks truth, not having to apologize for not wanting to give up some habit. And we won't mention some because it would embarrass some people. So it isn't as easy to find a person who will do righteousness and seek truth. Would you? At all costs or whatever the cost? Would God, when he came to your door, stop the search for a righteous man? Or would he have to keep on knocking on doors? Solemn question. Now you answer it for yourself, man or woman. Oh, he can find people even in this church who are religious, but he's looking for a man or a woman that's righteous. He can find a lot of people busy with their, quote, ministries, unquote. But he's looking for someone that's busy in the Word, studying the Word, praying the Word down in their heart, so that when they stand up here, they can deliver it without any hesitation or fear of the looks on the faces, as we discovered in an earlier chapter, chapter 1. So there's no point in talking about this dead religious system, charismatic or non-charismatic. We just have to bring it right down to home and focus it on ourselves. If you had been living back there and God sent Jeremiah knocking on doors, would he end the search when he got to your house? Lady, gentlemen, or would he have to keep looking? Now, America, including the church, is being spared divine judgment right at this moment because of the presence of some faithful saints in this nation. But the question we're raising, are you one of them? Or if you were honest with yourself, would you say, thank God, it doesn't depend upon me for God to spare this nation or this contemporary church. Thank God it doesn't depend on me the way I live or the way I've responded to the word over the years. So the point is, the time is at hand when God is sending forth his messengers on the run, if you please, looking for someone who can be the cause for God postponing judgment a little while longer in this nation. Judgment is headed this way. I don't care what those false prophets in the West are preaching about God's going to bless America. God's already blessed America. There's no nation on earth been blessed like America. America has not responded spiritually in gratitude, not even in thanksgiving. So he said, we can't get people in this church, some to give thanks to God for what he's doing. So how could you expect this dead denominational system or the world out there to be thankful? He's looking for someone to be the cause for him postponing judgment. So you better pray for this nation and pray for yourself that you'll be the cause. God is not going to send messengers out on this search a second time. If he doesn't find it at your house, he isn't coming back. The time's too short. That's why some are dropping away. Have been. Some yet will. So if you're not heeding what the Spirit is saying to the church, one day soon is going to be Proverbs 29.1 for you with no chance to repent because God says, He that being often reproved hardens his heart shall be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy, without any remedy. You'll find out too late that you've said once too often, Oh, it's not the Lord. This is just a trial. Or I don't have to heed that instruction or chastening word that's coming over the pulpit from Hobart Freeman because, well, I'm a minister too. Or I'm a member of Faith Assembly. I've been there about as long as he has. You'll find out too late. It was thus saith the Lord and you didn't know it. If you're still getting offended because some new things come up that you haven't been instructed in, or you grew up in a generation where you didn't learn how to blush or be ashamed of sin, you're going to find out that God has put a messenger in this pulpit to tell you those things, 
And it's either shape up or ship out. God doesn't send you here to pick and choose and lay stuff on the shelf and try to make excuses for what's taught or what isn't because, well, I don't understand this or that. Fourthly, the absence of such a man. This is the sad part. The need for such a man, the value of such a man, the character of such a man, now the absence of such a man. Jeremiah covered every possibility in an effort to find a righteous man. He looked first among the poor, and then the rich, and then the common people, and finally the religious leaders, and he couldn't find a man. He looked first among the poor, verse 4. Therefore I said, surely these are the poor. His conclusion, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. See, verse 1, God said, go search for such a man, and he comes to the poor first, and he can't find a righteous man among them. The poor, the lower order of society, where you would expect to find some humility, you know, they're not as outgoing and pretentious and so forth as people that are middle class or well-to-do, and so you would expect to find some just old standards of morals and traditional ways that are conservative. You would expect them to be more honest and righteous and faithful than the rich, but he said he couldn't find anything. He says here, they lack righteousness and faithfulness because they're untrained in the way of the Lord, or we could say the way and the word of the Lord, and so he calls them foolish, foolish spiritually. Now, the lesson to be learned here is that it's natural for us to think because a person is poor, or let's take poor as a group, that they would not be subject to all of the temptations to sin as the more well-to-do where they can get out and get in a car and go where they want and buy all the sin they want and indulge in all the sin they want. The lesson to be learned that while it's natural to think that perhaps, yet you see here they're still just as lacking in righteousness as the rich. You see, gambling for pennies is as much a sin as gambling for high stakes, as the rich do. Getting drunk on beer and cheap wine is as much a sin as getting drunk on champagne or hundred-proof Kentucky bourbon. Cheating on your income tax, lying to your neighbor, fornicating, cannot be excused as the liberal churches and humanitarians try to do, saying, well, it's just because they're poor, or they haven't had the proper environment, or they lack education, or they'll blame the government for the poor's sin, the minorities and the poor, saying, well, there are too many social sins of the government. They don't take care of them. They don't give them enough welfare. But it's still just as much sin in the sight of God. So there's as much sin, Jeremiah shows, first of all, among the poor as the rich. Among this group, sin simply takes different forms. It may be in different degrees. For example, a poor person might defend himself or his rights by punching someone in the nose, where the rich would be more sophisticated. He has him arrested, taken to court, and put in jail. But it's still the same sin. The poor may try to justify stealing from the corner grocery, to feed my family because, after all, the welfare isn't enough anymore to pay for my beer and cigarettes and that new trashy vision that we had to buy because the other went on the blink. Whereas the rich, you see, he will steal also, but by manufacturing goods that have built-in depreciation. It can't last over a year or two or three years. Or he may gamble on the stock market and that sort of thing. The poor will curse you in gutter language, language of the street, where the rich, because of his education, knows how to curse you in three or four languages. But you see, it's just a difference of form or degree. Secondly, then, he looked among the great. Verse 5, he looked among the poor, couldn't find a righteous man. Secondly, the great. Verse 5, he said, Then I will get me unto the great men, and I will speak unto them. For they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But he found that these have altogether broken the yoke 
and burst the bonds. Couldn't find a one. Now, the great, of course, he's referring to the distinguished leaders, the social elite, the wealthy, the educated, the intellectual community. The answer is the same. Nothing suitable to spare judgment is to be found. Like today, they put themselves above the law because he says here, with one accord, they have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. You see, the great, the rich, feel like they're above the law. And today, just like then, the intellectuals believe they have evolved through secular education to the place where they don't have to believe in God and morals or respect the law. The judges take bribes, release the guilty. The political leaders are involved in all sorts of scandals including the police. The police will break laws they'll give you a ticket or arrest you for. You'll get a ticket for doing 56 on the highway. And how many times did you ever find a policeman doing 55? You never will. And the faster he goes, like if he's doing 70, you know where he's headed? For lunch. That's right. He doesn't want to be late. He's going to meet somebody there. And of course, there are exceptions to anything you say, but the wealthy liberals in Congress, for example, pass legislation to help the poor, to help the minorities, and they themselves don't contribute one dime of their money to help them. They're going to use your tax dollars. One of the leading liberal families, it has been reported, I've read it in more than one book concerning this family, one of the leading liberal families, the servants, the workers that have worked for them, say they're the most stingy people on the face of the earth. And they have hundreds of millions of dollars. But they'll pass legislation to help the poor. Well, my point is that they feel they're above the law. They have the money, the time, the education to seek righteousness, seek the truth, do righteousness. But they're some of the worst offenders. As Jeremiah says, they have broken the yoke with one accord. That means all of them have broken the yoke and they've burst the bonds. Then thirdly, he looked among the common people, the poor, the rich, the common people. Now you'll find this outlined throughout the chapter, various references to just the people as such, like verse 1, verse 7, and verses 20 to 28. And other references, but those especially. I want to read just verses 21 and 23 to set this out about the common people, the middle class, we could call them. Verse 21. Hear now this, O foolish people. You see, he's talking just about the people. Who are without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Then down to verse 23, But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They have revolted and gone. So what did he find among the common people? Or we could say the middle class in Jerusalem. And let's bring it down to our situation. What would he have found in middle class America? Well, verse 28. They are waxen fat. They shine, yea, they overpass, that is, exceed, in the deeds of the wicked. Now, the poorer class may get drunk on beer every weekend, curse his neighbor's dog for barking at midnight, sit in front of the trashy vision until he dies of boredom, that's the poor. The rich may gamble on the stock market and bring economic chaos and crises to America, and that's happened more than once through their gambling. The rich may wake up and go to sleep with a drink in their hand. But good old middle class America, the backbone of this nation, he says in verse 28, they overpass in their wickedness. You see, the poor may be crude in the way they sin and the rich sophisticated, but there's nothing like the middle class American to smoke himself to death, to consume 150 gallons of alcohol per capita, 
to gamble away his hard-earned money instead of using it for the family, to fornicate six days a week and twice on Sunday, to fill the air with his filth and profanity, to fight at the drop of a hat, to defend his rights, to lie and cheat like the devil, and yet all the time never failing to show up at a Sunday morning service in his local church, dropping his dollar in the plate and putting on his robes of piety. And believes, really believes, he's on his way to heaven because, well, after all, he doesn't rob banks. So Jeremiah knew then, and he would know today if he was in America, how hopeless the case is to find a righteous man, a faithful man, a man who sought truth, to find such a one in the backbone or middle class America. And middle class America, Jeremiah is saying, like middle class Jerusalem, is the worst of all of them. That's what he said there. He said, what about the people? He said, they overpass. They exceed in their wickedness. Worse than the lot. And you think about it, that's true. It's the middle class America. That's most people. There really aren't poor people in America. That's a rare thing to find a poor person. I don't care what the media says. We don't want to go into that. And there are rich, but not that many. I'm talking about rich, rich. Most people are middle class, upper, lower, middle class. And they are the ones responsible for this wicked sodomite nation being what it is, because they make up the most of the nation. Like in Jerusalem, the mass of the people were the people, not the poor or the rich, but the ones he's addressing here. And so one day, like the spongy, corrupt cancer that it is, the whole middle class America is just going to sink down of its own weight into the pit of hell, and the poor and the rich are going to be hard on their heels following after. That is, the sinners. Then he looked fourthly and lastly among the religious leaders for a righteous man. Well, if you ever thought you might find one, that's where you would look. I mean, that's just the way it is. Let's face it. If a person came in here looking for a righteous man, they see too many faces. So they'll look for a righteous person if they want someone to come and pray the prayer of faith. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so they would look for a minister, wouldn't they? That's just the way it is. So what did he find? Verse 30, A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Now, wonderful, by the way, in King James can mean awesome and awful and terrible. It's just like some of the other words, a poor translation. So we could say a terrible and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And he goes on to say, the people love to have it so. So there's another verse talking about how corrupt the people are, the common people. So what did he find when he looked among those that said God had sent them? And if he had, he sent them to prevent the very judgment that's on its way. What did he find? Jeremiah said, to my astonishment and horror... They were not only not guiding the people or correcting them for their failure to heed the word, but they were prophesying lies and the priests were following their prophecies. That's what it means when he says here that the priests bear rule by their means, literally at their means or as a result of their prophecies. They're following their word instead of God's word. In other words, they're following the false prophets' words. Well, we have it again today. The religious leadership, for the most part, is not where you would look to find a righteous man. Now, it's no different than it was then. That was a last day message, and we've got a last day message, so we're just going to preach it. The seminaries, for the most part, and the denominational leaders, for the most part, are not men who are teaching the word. They don't even believe it's inspired, so many of them. But they're teaching manology, man's theology, man's creeds. And what they're doing, the students who sit in those schools, what they're doing, they're following those teachers like blind birds, and then they go out in the churches and parrot what they've heard as if, you know, it's gospel truth. They might go into those schools sometimes believing the Bible, but they'll talk them out of it after they get in there. Now, I've seen that happen, so it's not something that I've imagined. 
But as Jesus said in Matthew 23, they will compass land and sea to make one disciple. And when he is made, they will make him twofold more a child of hell than themselves. I've seen it happen. He says, yours is the greater damnation, speaking to the prophets and the priests, the leaders. How can you escape the damnation of hell, you serpents and generation of vipers? People think you're being unkind just to read that. Unless it's in a Sunday school lesson. Now, I've seen the religious schools like the seminaries. In fact, I've experienced this very thing where they'll send out their smooth-talking representatives to the Christian colleges, let's say religious colleges, and to the churches to get students, entice students to come to their seminary. I had that actually happen, a group of us. So it happens all the time. They'll send out their smooth-talking representatives. Then after they get them in those schools, we'll make them twofold more the child of hell, twofold more agnostics than they are themselves. So Jeremiah says his search was fruitless. He couldn't find any, even among the religious leadership. He said they prophesy lies and the priests are just following the lies instead of the word of God. Now, the world, the institutional church, would have found someone. Why is it that men are able to find someone that they think is suitable when God said he couldn't find anybody? Well, we read 1 Samuel 16, 7. Let me read the whole verse now. But the Lord said unto Samuel, this is why men can find candidates for that office of a righteous man, and God can't find them. But the Lord said to Samuel, look not on a man's countenance. Even Samuel was looking at the big, tall, handsome son of Jesse. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. The Lord chose Paul that even he admitted that he was sometimes crude in speech that men accused that he was weak in his bodily presence, strong in his letters, his epistles, but weak in his bodily presence. God doesn't choose you because of any great stature in the eyes of the world or physically or any other way. First Corinthians chapter 1, we've said it before. Read that. He chooses the foolish, the base, the weak, the despised. The world rejects so that no flesh can glory in his presence. So he says here, don't look at his outward appearance. You see, men look at the head to see if it's handsome or filled with secular knowledge and wisdom. But God looks at the heart to see if it's spiritually beautiful and filled with knowledge of him, his word, and faith. So remember, Jeremiah is preaching at the close of the age just before God destroyed the nation. God is raising up men, prophets in this end time. Now at the end of the ages, just as he did Jeremiah to search for a righteous man or a righteous woman who can stand in the gap and stay his hand of judgment for a little while longer upon this nation, upon this world, so that he can prepare people for the end time harvest. The question again is, have you determined to be one of those that he's looking for? Is judgment being withheld Right now, it is being withheld. It's overdue. Is judgment being withheld because of you or in spite of you? You have to answer that. We all do. Father, let not a word fall to the ground that has been served up as the evening meal for your people. Let not a word be lost, but at each point where we needed to hear what we heard, may it be applied to that heart, to our hearts. Because we know, we know in our spirits, some of us know at least, that you're not coming back a second time looking for righteousness, not in this church. But if it's not to be found now, it will not be found in that man or woman 
You'll not come a second time. You'll not send a messenger who will stand in the pulpit without compromise or concern for his personal welfare, preach the pure word of God at whatever the personal cost. But you're not going to send a second one. The people must either receive that as from the Lord or be rejected. Because, Father, we can say without any fear of contradiction or pride or boasting that this church is fed the pure word. This church is given light that few, if any, other churches are receiving in this hour. And it's all to your glory. But that we should not treat it lightly. We should not have to be admonished about sins and being caught up in the affairs of this life and resistance or disobedience. Sitting under a word like this, God ought to be able to find in every seat a righteous man, a righteous woman. And we believe there are those here that is preserving by their faith, by their prayers, by their life, by their obedience, preserving this church, this nation, yea, even the world, from the judgment that's due it, that's past due. And so we thank you that we're one of those. We don't claim to be the only one. Surely we're not the only one in this world, but we thank you for being chosen to be one that stands in the gap to give the Holy Spirit time to work in the lives of both ourselves and all who are to be brought in to the end time move for them to hear. O oh God, that we might all be men and women whose very presence stays your hand of judgment in this hour. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen.